answer it briefly. We've touched a bunch of times today on, on the DSM and uh, how over the decades, you know, it's gone from being, you know, a, kind of a pamphlet to being a phone book where there's a different flavor of crazy for every day of the year. Uh, but I want you to engage in a bit of a speculative exercise. So the DSM-5 is due within a couple of years. But let's forget about that for a sec. I want you to speculate on what you think the DSM-6 will look like about 25 years down the road, and furthermore, what it should look like. <laughs> we can go left to right or right to left. Let's go left to right. Tony, jump in. I think what... No? Yeah, now it's on, yeah. Um, I think that with the explosion of neuroscience research, I think the future DSM-6 or 7 will all have um, brain-based disorders. I can see it being serotonin dysregulation disorders, dopamine dysregulation mm -hmm. disorders, um, norepinephrine dys dysregulation disorders, and, and the symptoms. That's, I think, is where it's going. It's going to be the final... Uh, reductionism that I think psychiatry has been looking for since uh, since it began, um, and that, that that Freud himself had envisioned would occur one day. Uh, that's what's going to happen, I think, uh, as we get to go to to overcome some of the issues that were mentioned today by Jordan and by and by John and by uh, Terry as well. In terms of what I think it should look, I don't know, so I'm not going to answer that one. So, <laughs> um, I I think that. Um, I, I sort of agree with to, uh, Tony in one sense that I think uh, neuroscientific stuff is going to be more significant. But I think neuroscience is right now quite philosophically incompetent, and it's about to go through uh, something of, uh, hopefully, there's signs that ideas from machine learning, from dynamical systems theory, other things like this, um, are starting to inform neuroscience, and some very simplistic models of the relationship between cognition and the brain are starting to loosen. So I, I think I, what I foresee is that, yes, uh, the model is going to be more neuroscientific, but that neuroscience is going to be much more sophisticated philosophically than it previously is. And it won't strike us as such simplistic, mechanistic models of what humans are and how they pursue their goals in the world. And uh, what, did I, what do I think it should do? Uh, I think the uh, attempts to try to integrate, um, so, try to try and get some kind of purchase on the centrality of development to cognition. You know, uh, more and more what's emerging is not that cognition develops, but that cognition is development, cognition as development. And I think that's going to become much, that should be uh, much more central. I think uh, we may be inching forward a bit, uh, recognizing some of our errors, trying to correct them. Um, I mean, we, we, for example, we no longer think that autism comes from refrigerator mothers. Um, some of the, uh, what seem to be more biologically based disorders, uh, some of the schizophrenias, uh, some of the mood disorders may move over more toward neurology. Uh, and, and that's what I think, Tony, in terms of, you know, the uh, neurotransmitter dysregulation type uh, things. Uh, things on the, on the other end of the spectrum that are uh, more in the adjustment disorders, the personality disorders, and so forth, uh, I think we're just going to keep inching along in terms... These are very much culturally defined il illnesses. So, uh, you know, as our culture evolves, you know, our understanding of these sorts of disorders will change, and there'll be somewhat different uh, descriptions. Um, I think good progress is being made in some in terms of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, understanding the uh, behavioral and, and neurological aspects of those. Uh, uh, Ruth Linnaeus, a, a psychiatrist at Western, does fMRI work uh, with folks with PTSD, m mostly girls who have been sexually abused, abused in the childhood. And, and uh, there's something that looks pictorially like repressed memories. 
that is uh, uh, neural activity not connected to conscious areas of the brain. So um, I think hit and miss. Probably DSM-6 or 7 will be very recognizable from what we have now, but maybe inching along. Hopefully one of the things that'll happen um, along with the movement towards biology and so far as that'll be possible is that there'll be more integration of proper psychometrics into the DSM because we've got pretty good trait models of personality now, but the category structure that underlies the non-biological disorders is really a mess and everybody who's involved in the DSM knows it. It's partly a historical artifact and it's partly a prag pragmatic document, but people are hacking away at getting the underlying category structures right and that's going to have more and more effect over the next 20 years. So. I have a couple more points. People often don't know that Freud, before he developed psychoanalysis, was working on a biological model of mental illness that he never published himself in his lifetime, the Project for a Scientific Psychology. An elaborate, um, kind of um, simplistic look at it, but very, very complex for, for, for that time, where he described the biological basis of all human psychopathology, but he put it away. He never published it until after, after his death was published. Um, and that's why when he realized that there was no way I could develop a biology of, of psychoanalysis, he developed psychoanalysis proper as, as we know it. Secondly, secondly, the other point, just to where I see things going, and I... If you, if you at all follow um, trends in addiction, which, which I do, um, that that's a dominant model in the U.S. today, that addiction is a brain disease. And they keep stressing that in all the major organizations that fund it, that treat it. Addiction is a brain disease, and we have to treat it like a brain disease, including psychological techniques, but primarily looking for what's happening in the brain and to treat it as a disease at that level. So I, I, I don't see that changing for a long time, and I think it's going to influence even the diagnoses of these things as time goes by. I, don't think, I think that's going to be a, a great boon because it probably means there will be treatments that are more specific and, and tied to the disorders, but it probably is probably the death now for things like Buddhist psychology and Buddhist diagnosis. However, look what happened in psychoanalysis. They developed their own manual, the PDM, the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual, as a way to capture psychodynamics and family issues and personal history in a way that made sense within that model. And that's, that's also about an 800-page tome full of psychodynamic formulations, which were kicked out of DSM um, several uh, decades ago, several versions ago. Um, and so I could see alternative models. And what, what um, Jordan mentioned, the, the, the beginning of a dimensional approach to things, it may lead to, to the, 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 the end of DSM. The ICD-9 might take over. There, be an, um, there could be an alternative. If you follow the politics of DSM, there's lots of controversy as to whether DSM is completely going down the wrong path and that it should be scuttled completely. And, and start all over again and, and, and come out to a better view in the end. So we don't know, but these are some of the trends that are going to be playing out. So So... <laughs> um, I'm wondering a bit about um, uh, conflict between two things, uh, pluralism in approaches to um, treatment of psychopathology and accountability for those who are treating uh, those pathologies. Because if you have, it seems like, I mean, and definitely one thing I think we've gotten from this conference is that there's lots of different approaches that seem that they are relevant and they all have different things to say and we want to bring them together or at least let them all exist at the very least as opposed to say, no, this is the one true treatment or whatever. Um, but if you have many different approaches, you have this uh, danger that if they're all fighting for sort of dominance as the way to treat the mind or something like this, if they're also the ones evaluating their own success for a given patient, then there's a conflict of interest there. Just like, you know, uh, chiropractors weren't allowed to sell their own, sorry, naturopaths weren't allowed to sell their own supplements after a while in a lot of places. Because like, oh, you need, what you exactly need is the thing that I'm selling. And of course, you're not directly selling supplements. You're saying you need my technique or, you know, my technique is working for you, but, you know, if the person treating someone is also the same person saying whether that person is now healthy, it's like they're writing their own report card. So um, what I'm wondering is uh, what uh, the panel thinks about the possibility of establishing sort of 
um, well, not necessarily a separate discipline, maybe one day, but some kind of separate body which tries to um, have a somewhat a theoretical assessment of various different approaches and how well they're working. So, you know, gathering statistics, you know, like, you know, comparing like, well, these people have this, you know, positive outcome when they apply this kind of uh, approach versus this approach. And, you know, having, having some kind of, you know, there should be some error feedback on the people who are treating the patients and not, not, that isn't just their own conception of, oh, yeah, I'm helping people. I'm totally helping people because, you know, I'm, a, I'm doing well. I'm a good person. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what is what? So, yeah, just to clarify the question about having an objective, separate party evaluating the many different uh, approaches. I think it's an important one because there are, there's always these perspectives and you wonder how they fit. The only way, the, the best answer to that question is scientific method. Um, that's why we have scientific journals, peer review, um, that look for things like this and make sure that uh, in the scientific process, it's, it's kind of um, self-correcting. And things that don't work in the end will be, will be uh, lost. And things that do work will get reinforced uh, to avoid that kind of bias and that kind of uh, ideolo ideological approach to things. That is the safest way, that's the safest way. That's how all these technologies we have today occur, is through the scientific method, and, and, and that's why they work. Um, it's, not based on, it's not based on opinion or people's perspective and what works. Does it work? How, you know, how does a cell phone work? You can't pretend to make a cell phone work. Either it does or it doesn't, and it'll show, it'll show itself based on technology. Same with uh, the technologies of the mind. If the treatments work, it will, show to be, it will show to work, and the scientific method through peer review, publication, replication, which is a basis. No matter how powerful a treatment is, if only one person can do it, it's not going to go far. It's got to be done by others in different places, and that's how you establish the validity of it. That is a safeguard, I think, that will prevent um, weirdness of uh, creeping into, into treatment. Sorry. Adam, can I ask you to explain a little bit more? Like, were you proposing a legislative body or some political body? Or what, what was... Those things do exist, like the Cochrane database. Uh, there are people who actually collect all the data on the treatment, all of them, and come up with a bottom line. This is what works, this doesn't work. So there are organizations that are, that are beyond the scientists, beyond uh, universities, that serve that function. Um, all, all governments use it to, to decide what, they, what they're going to fund, what's going to be researched. So there are, you know, you're pointing to something that's kind of um, an important part of, of, of that, is that establishment of external reviewers of the data. Um, so I don't have too much to add to what uh, Tony had to say about sort of relying on the scientific method and sort of, uh, you know, uh, a distribution of ins socially sanctioned institutions to monitor this. Um, I guess, I, I mean, the problem... Okay. Okay. I don't know how you how you would solve that problem at all ever. <laughs> uh, I, I mean that, that that's like a platonic question about you know ultimately who guards the guardians. I, I don't know. Uh, well, but no, because what your your very point is we don't e we don't even have a shared standard of failure. So how would you even be able to state that? Well, you'd, certainly you're not proposing just, you know, a democracy on this. We just vote and the majority decides. I mean, you're not proposing that either. Well, that's sort of what we're relying on, people's freedom to leave the process or to shout at their therapists or to take us to court, things like that. That's what we're, that's what we're relying on. I guess that's my answer. Well, no, I don't. I don't need to. I don't need to answer. Cut off. <laughs> you can answer. We should definitely answer, and then I think we have time for maybe one or two more brief. Yeah, questions. we should. We should keep the conversation flowing, right? 
Just one quick thing on uh, consumer reports. Is, is that what you mentioned, consumer reports? 1995, Martin Seligman and some other researchers helped 